Crossbridge, we're so glad you're with us today. My name is Morgan Gallion, and we have some awesome things that are happening here at Crossbridge. And one of those is we're having the Send pre rally on August 3rd. So, this is a worship and missions activation night with speaker Andy Bird, and our Crossbridge worship team is going to be leading worship. It is going to be a powerful night. If you need childcare, you need to register. But other than that, you can just show up, and we know that God is going to move mightily during those times. So, be sure to be there August 3rd. You can find more information on our website. Well, today we're continuing our series, Jesus the Storyteller, and Daniel Gonzalez is going to be sharing a parable with us out of Luke 19 and what it looks like to be obedient unto Jesus. With everything that we have, we want our lives to reflect him. So it's going to be a great morning, and I'm going to read out of Psalm 139 as we just prepare our hearts for what the Lord has for us this morning. And in Psalm 139, in verse 4, it says, Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem in behind and before you lay your hand upon me. So God knows it all. He knows your life before today and after today and right now where you're sitting in this auditorium or at home. He knows everything about you and he is seeking you and loves you accordingly. And so we lean into that truth today as we just learn more out of God's word. Good morning. My name is Brian. If you're new with us, welcome to Crossbridge. How are you guys doing? You guys ready to worship? Okay, I don't have anybody up here singing with me today, so y'all gonna have to sing, all right? Don't be shy, okay? Even if you feel like you can't sing or hold a tune or any of that, the Lord delights when you open your mouth and sing his praise. When we worship him, no one else can do that but you. So let's, let's sing together. Yeah, I am free. 
hell lost another one I am free oh I am free yeah I am free sing hell lost another one I am free oh I am free oh I come on sing it out hell lost another one I am free oh I am so grateful for all that you've done and all that you're doing in us and through us. Come on, just lift your hearts to him. He's here right now. His presence is here to restore joy, to bring freedom, to remind us of his love. This is a house of worship. This is a place of praise. Where every demon trembles. Where we proclaim your name. This is a house of healing. Everything 
that's here with us right now. Thank you for your nearness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You guys can go ahead and be seated. I just want to take a quick moment and let you know we have a, um, a really cool thing happening August 3rd at 6 p.m. right here. Um, I'll be leading worship. Andy Bird is bringing the word. It's, it's a, it's a pre-rally for the SEND. And what the SEND is, is an organization that exists to mobilize our generation for the great harvest. We believe a great awakening is coming to America and we wanna be a part of that in any way that we can. And and our heart is that we we catch the fire, the passion to reach the lost in our city and abroad. And I just wanna encourage you to come out that night. It's gonna be a night of real transformation. I believe the Holy Spirit's gonna be here in a really strong way. Um, And we're just believing that the Lord is gonna encounter our hearts and change our lives. And it'll be a, a, a night of just equipping and activation for you. And I'm just excited that we're a part of what the Lord is doing with the Send. It's a, it's a really big ministry. Like in Brazil, they last, you no, know, before the pandemic, they had probably 80,000 people in a, in a stadium arena. A ton of people got saved. The Lord transformed a lot, of, a lot about that city. And um, they're, they're having another stadium event in Kansas City next year, I think in June. But the pre-rally event for that event is here, August 3rd at 6 p.m. And I'd love to see you come out and catch the fire that the Lord has for us to carry so that we can burn bright in the world we live in. Amen? Amen. Here's Brian Hannes. Hey, Brian. (laughs) Hey, Brian was just talking about the church, the awakening of the church. And I looked out and I saw like six people yawning. So can everybody like just like tell me that you're there? Just like give me some. Okay, thank you. That, that helps a little bit. Good. Um, we do believe that, that God wants to awaken his church. He wants to free his church. He wants to empower his church to do what? To be that love expressed in your homes, in your neighborhoods, in your cities, into the world. If you notice, Brian was a little uh, alone on stage today. That's because our worship team, along with Pastor Kirk and Debbie, are actually in the Middle East with our second team because we always want to be a church that goes with the love of Jesus. Amen? Um, so this, uh, this morning, uh, we wanted to start off with just a, a quick testimony from Mandy Fultz. So come on up, Mandy. Give it up for Mandy. <laughs> Mandy is our, our director, our children's director of first through fifth grade, and she went on the first team to the Middle East, and we wanted her to just share a little bit about what God was doing there. How long do I have? <laughs> So the last time I was on this stage, uh, I was actually telling you guys uh, we were about to go to Uganda. And um, what's funny and how the Lord works is we did a major pivot detour. um, And Uganda, that night, I think, after I spoke, um, the borders were closed. And so um, our team rallied back together. Our missions team did an amazing job. Um, And we ended up in the Middle East, which was not our plan, but the Lord's plan. So what I want to share with you guys, there's a million stories from all of us on our our amazing team. Um, Too many to share here this morning. Um, But the biggest thing was I had a certain expectation. And um, when that didn't get met, 
um, I took it to the Lord, and I was like, I don't understand. I don't get it. So, And this can apply across the board in your life. If, if there's something going on that you don't get, you don't understand, you, th- you heard something from the Lord, and you're like, not sure I'm following. And if you've ever had, um, or if you've never had this happen, maybe, how the Lord uses the body of Christ, how the Lord uses prophetic prayer, how the Lord uses his word um, to just keep redirecting. And that's what happened. So when we found out we were headed to the Middle East, um, the Lord used all of those things to confirm, yes, Mandy, this is my plan. Yes, go. Um, And so I just encourage you guys that if there's something on your heart and you're asking the Lord and he's saying, say yes, say yes, you will be blessed beyond measure. Um, And the whole trip, it was really about just loving people and meeting people where they were at. Um, There was no other agenda other than to love people. So I encourage you guys to, if you're called to do something like that, say yes. Thanks, Mandy. Um, Yeah, the the strategy that the teams have, and we partner with uh, the Antioch Waco Church that's going there as well as some other Antioch churches that are all converging in the Middle East for this trip. But the strategy is really to pray, listen for where the Spirit's directing, see where he's moving, and when you have engagements with people, share the love of Jesus. Pretty complicated, right? That's it. That's what, that's what God wants us all to do. Well, let's pray. Join me in prayer. Let's just pray for our team that's there now and that God would continue to move in their hearts. The Jesus, we are uh, joining together. Our voices, our hearts are joining together in prayer this morning. On behalf of our brothers and sisters that are in the Middle East, from various U.S. cities and around the world, but our hearts are with them to see, God, would you speak and lead and direct them to those divine appointments? We're we're just proclaiming the goodness of the Lord in that land. Because they're there, the Holy Spirit is there. You want to encounter their hearts. You want them to know the love and the hope of Jesus. Lord God, would you do eternal work, like, like spiritual work in the hearts and lives of those that they come into contact with? We're, we're proclaiming that today is the day of salvation. Like, 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 would you teach us all, Lord, how to value today? Lord, and for what that is for all that may come to know you and the eternal plans that you have for their lives, we just say yes to and we just bless your name in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we got a couple of announcements. We can put the, Q, the QR code that, um, if you want to see kind of what's happening here at Crossbridge. But it is summer. Uh, it is Family Sunday. We do have our kids in here. So we are, are going to continue with uh, a tradition here at Crossbridge we call Stump the Pastor, where somebody brings a bag with an object, and then a pastor has to come up with a biblical application of which I are he today. Uh, So kids, come on down and let's cue the music. Notice the boys start going nuts and the girls just sit down all pretty. That's so good. Thank you guys for being here. All right. Glad to see you. Hey, can I see some teeth? Y'all smile at me. Let me see some teeth. Okay, good. I don't see any teeth. All right, there's some teeth. All right, good. Okay, Robert's boys, y'all got the bag? Yes? All right. Josh and Courtney, I want to say thank you, but I'm not sure yet. We'll see. (laughs) Thank you. Great. Well, um, yeah, that's not too deep of a discussion there, is it, Josh? <clears throat> I mean, I mean, Robert's kids. Um, what is this? What kind of dinosaur is that? You say a brachiosaurus. I was going to say that, but I just wanted to see if you knew it. Okay, this is a brachiosaurus. Does anybody know what? Who raise your hand if you know what this is? All right, good. What, what is this dinosaur known for? Anybody know? It's long neck, okay. Strong strength, okay, good. Long neck, okay, good. Well, let, let's go with the long neck. Um, 
you know, kids, <laughs> we should reach our up all the time. We should be reaching to God, you know, like with our necks, like reaching up. And because and there is a scripture in Psalms that talks about how God inclines his ear to listen to our prayers. Did you know that? Can you like close your eyes for just a minute and picture God leaning down with his ear to listen to you. And then picture you reaching your neck up to touch him. That's good. Yeah. He's that close. He's that real. You're mad. It's sometimes that's okay. Um, but, but he does want to be close to you. He is a real God who cares about every detail of your life. And he wants to, you to know that he sees you and he values you. And he's made you special and unique. Some of you may have a longer neck than others. Some of you may be taller or shorter. Some of you may be stronger. But he sees and he's made each one of you unique and special. Okay, Let's thank Jesus for that. Lord, thank you for uh, the uniqueness of how you've made every single one of these kids and us. Thank you for the way that you do incline your ear to us. Um, and thank you for making all things, everything, in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Give them a hand. All right, kids. Dancing music goes back on. You're, you're free to go. Back to Kid Zone. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Hey, our kids are headed out to camp today, too, to, uh, to kids' camp. So what we wanted to do just as they go is, uh, is just pray a prayer of blessing and, and uh, over them as they leave. I don't know how many kids we got, a, b- a bunch. Um, but we're partnering with another church, and they're going to be there all week this week, and we want them to just encounter Jesus and his love for, so, for them. So I want you to do this. Just extend a hand of blessing to our kids just like we do. Just picture that that's your kid, your child. You want them to experience the heart of Jesus. So, Lord, we do that right now. We say, come and encounter their hearts. Show them yourself in in a sunset, in another person, uh, in in the time of worship, in the time of teaching, in just having a blast and being a kid outdoors in your beautiful creation. Lord, would you would you just encounter their hearts in a special way and stamp it, like seal it, like burn it into their hearts, like this is who you are, your identity, how clearly you are that for them. And would you sear their identity in who you made them to be? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, this morning uh, we have a treat. Uh, Daniel Gonzalez is coming to to preach and uh, give us the word. Yep. Uh, Daniel leads The Bridge, which is a college young adult ministry. Um, His family's been here for a long time, but Daniel is an outstanding teacher, and you're going to be blessed. So let's give it up for Daniel Gonzalez. Well, I'm so excited to be here with you this morning. As Brian said, I'm the young adult coordinator here, and it's been such a privilege hanging out with uh, the college and young adults here, just serving Jesus, being in community together, um, and just serving the community, just going after it. And so it's been such a privilege to do that. So if you're an 18 to 30 year old and you're looking for community and you want to get plugged in, feel free to find me afterwards or go check out the website. We would love to get you in a life group or at a worship night with us or serving the community. Well, this morning we're continuing the Jesus, the storyteller series, going through the parables of Jesus. And I love the parables. Because some of the parables are super easy to understand. It's like, oh, I know what Jesus means by that. But then there's some of them where it's like, okay, this is really confusing. I'm going to have to do some detective work and go figure some things out. Maybe put some pieces together. Go look at some Old Testament references and other teachings of Jesus and put them all together. And I think Pastor Kirk did a great job last week of just kind of giving us an understanding on how to read the parable. Something he said last week. Because you can't just really read one of them in isolation and, and create a set of beliefs and doctrines off just one parable, you have to bring them together and bring the teachings of Jesus together so that we have a deeper understanding of who he is and what he's called us to. So if you have your Bible with you this morning, I would love for you to turn with me to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, we're gonna be in verses 11 through 27. So you can go ahead and turn there. Luke chapter 19, verses 11 through 27. And let's read it together. It says this. While they were listening to this, He went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. And he said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country 
to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called 10 of his servants and gave them 10 minas, which was a unit of currency at that time. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him. And they sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and, and returned home. And, and then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, sir, your mina has earned 10 more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in, in the very small matter, take charge of 10 cities. Then the second came and said, sir, your mina has earned five more. And his master answered, well, then you take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, sir, here is your mina. I've kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and you reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servants. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. Sir, they said, he already has 10. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. Listen here. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. You're not going to see that one on Disney+. Plus. <laughs> Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth, for your love, for your mercy. We thank you that you know each of us and you know what we're going through. You know us right where we're at. And you want to come speak words of life and hope. You want to restore our lives like we were singing earlier. You rebuild. You restore all that's broken. So, Jesus, we invite your presence in this place this morning. Would you come and do that? We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there's a traditional way of looking at this passage, and I want to acknowledge it because there's so much truth in it. But I also want to come at this passage with a different perspective this morning. And the traditional way of looking at it is usually that Jesus is the king and that he entrusts each of us with resources, gifts, and talents. And he's calling us to use those gifts, resources, and talents to be good stewards of them, to love him, to love others well with them. And one day we're going to give an account on how we use those gifts, those resources, and those talents. Now that is so true. That is something that is so important to do when God entrusts something to us, when he blesses us with something. It's so important that we use it wisely that we use it to love God, that we use it to love other people. But I want to look at this passage from another perspective. You know, when I was a little kid, my grandma lived with my family, and one of the things I remember my grandma doing all the time was making puzzles. It always seemed like she was going to the dollar store and getting a new puzzle, and she would sit in her room in the afternoons and put together these puzzles. And I remember being a little kid, going to her door, like peeking in, knocking, walking in. Grandma, can I, can I make a puzzle with you? And being the gr good grandma that she was, she'd invite me in. She's like, of course. And there was something I remember her doing. She would take this puzzle in the box, and she'd pour it out on the table. And what she would do is she'd begin sorting out. And what was just this chaotic mess of puzzle pieces, she begins working through it. And the thing that she would do is she would start by building the frame. She'd get the outer layer first, and then she began working her way in. And then what was just this chaotic mess became this coherent picture that you could look at. And you would just smile, thinking, whoa. Yeah, I saw the picture on the box, but in person it looks way, way better. I'm sure you've had that experience before when you've made a puzzle, but this is what I want us to do this morning. I want us to put some pieces together so that we have an understanding of who Jesus is and what he has called us to. So... To do that, we have to ask some really, really important questions. We have to ask, what was going on during the time? What were the people dealing with? Who were their neighbors? What was the situation? Were they being oppressed by anybody? Who was Jesus' audience? What was their situation? 
So let's go back in time a little bit, and let's begin to understand the situation. One of the things I love that has helped us do that more and more is the Chosen series. If you have not watched it, I encourage you, please go and watch it. It is an amazing series, and I love it because it has been one of the most accurate portrayals of Jesus in the first century. So go and watch it if you have time. But in the first century, the time that Jesus walked the earth, the economic situation was not a good one. It was terrible. Because there really wasn't much of a middle class. It was either very, very poor people or it was very, very rich people. There was no in-between. And usually these poor people were being taken advantage of by the rich people. I have a few pictures up on the screen. I remember being a little kid, my mom taking me to the library, and if I didn't have a book that had pictures in it, then it was not worth my time. So I have a few pictures with me. This is the ruins of a house in Capernaum. Some believe that this was Peter's home. They've excavated it, but as you can see, it's, it's very simple. It's just mud, rocks put together. And a whole family probably would have lived in a small little home like this, and if they had this, they were very blessed. They didn't have much, they were very poor. I have another picture here of this place in Nazareth that they were excavating. As you can see, it's similar. It's just rocks and mud put together, and a whole family would live in a small place like this. These were the very, very poor people, and they were very blessed to even have this. But then you have the rich people, and I have another picture up here. And this is just kind of a model of what a rich person's house would have looked like. You see it's pretty elaborate, lots of rooms, very spacious. And then the next picture I have is one that I took myself in Israel. You can see the floor. Look how elaborate it is. It's all these tiles put together to make a picture. This is the floor. This is what they would walk on. This is what a rich person would have while a poor person would be living with stones and mud. So you see, there wasn't really a middle class, and this was the situation of the time. And Jesus spends most of his time with these poor people. He's giving them words of life and hope, showing them the way of God. Saying things like, blessed are the poor because you are going to see God do something. And he started doing things in a totally different way that it caught the attention of rich people. And they would be like, wait, what's going on here? There's something different about this guy. I kind of want part of it. I want to be part of this. I want to be in this. But there were three big areas of corruption that the poor people had to deal with that was just really oppressive. And the first one was Herod and the rich men of the time. Because for rich men, they had to manage their wealth. And they would have to travel all through the country to find new business ventures. They would have to go make sure their wealth was being managed properly. And they would have very trusted servants who were probably with them for a very long time. And what they would tell to each of these servants when they had to travel to go take care of other business dealings, they would tell their servant, here, here's some money. I want you to go do something with this while I'm gone. And the servant was left with a goal a goal that he had to reach, and he had to come back with more money than he was entrusted with. And usually that goal was at least twice as much. And then anything in excess, this servant could keep for himself. So you can imagine there was an incentive there. So the servants, they would go and begin making money, and they had to do it quickly before the master came back. Because if they didn't come back with the money they were supposed to have, oh, they were going to hear it from the master. They might even be killed because they didn't have the right money. So they had to go and make it quickly. And what they would do is they they would go and exploit the poor, the vulnerable, and the uneducated. They'd go find somebody in a really, really desperate situation, maybe a poor farmer. And they'd pretend to be like a hero, like a good guy, saying, oh, I could give you a loan. I, I can take care of this for you. And a poor, uneducated person in a desperate situation would see that and be like, whoa, yes, I need that. Thank you so much. But what these servants would not disclose is the interest rates that they would charge. These interest rates were upwards of 200%. So when reality hit, these poor farmers would lose everything. And then what these servants would also do is they would manipulate the prices of things, especially crops. They would raise the price and sell it for a good, good price, and then they would lower it when they had to buy. So you can see that it was a very, very difficult situation, very oppressive. And then they would return to the master when the master came back and said, here's your money. And they would keep whatever they took in excess. It was not a good situation for the poor. It gives you more of a perspective when Jesus was speaking to him, reaching out with love and mercy. And then there was this guy named Herod the Great during the time of Jesus. And Herod was a genius, genius guy. Very wealthy, great businessman. I have another picture up here, and this is one of Herod's many palaces. This is a man-made mountain, by the way, that he built, made it a palace. This was one of his secret hiding places. He was actually later buried in this in this 
place and, and the tomb that they built up there, it kind of makes you think about when Jesus was saying, if you tell this mountain move, it'll be tossed into the sea. Maybe he was pointing at that mountain, I don't know. But this is one of his places, just a genius man. And so what happened is because he was a great businessman, Caesar, who was the emperor of Rome at the time, who controlled the entire known world, said, hey, I want you to be king over this Israel region of the world so you can kind of keep the peace. But there was a problem because Herod was also a very, very cold-hearted, brutal, severe, hard man, had no value for human life, hated people, especially the Jews. Just a terrible, terrible guy, had no regard for humanity. He would work his Jewish slaves until they died, and he didn't even care. It, he was an ugly, ugly ruler, and on top of that, he was also an Edomite. If you know what an Edomite is, that is somebody who descended from the line of Esau. That goes all the way back to Genesis, Jacob, and Esau. God decided to work through Jacob, change his name to Israel, wanted to bless all nations through Israel. And so for an Edomite to be king of the Jews, this was an insult. This was terrible. Because in Deuteronomy 17, Moses said, you cannot have somebody to be king over you who is not an Israelite. And so this was an insult and corruption and ugly. But Herod the Great died when Jesus was a young boy and left the kingdom to his children. And he had one son in particular named Archelaus, but we'll just call him Herod Jr. because that's a lot easier to pronounce. And Herod Jr. wanted to rule over all his siblings. Just probably a really insecure guy, needed, every, needed to control everything, just really greedy. And so what Herod Jr. does is he wants to be king, but he needs to be appointed by Caesar first. And so what he does is he goes to Caesar. He heads off to a foreign country to be named king over a land where the citizens did not want him to be king. And what happens is some Pharisees and Jews catch wind of this, and they're like, no, we cannot let this guy be king. Remember what his dad did? No. And so they send a delegation to stop him. This delegation reaches Rome, and they plead with Caesar, Caesar, please do not make this man king over us. Please don't do it. But it was all in vain because Herod the Great and Caesar had a good relationship. So when Herod Jr. comes knocking on Caesar's door, he's like, there you go, buddy. Take the kingdom. It's, like, it's yours. And so Herod Jr. returns back to Israel, and he hears about this delegation that was sent to stop him. And he's furious. He's angry, just like his dad, cold-hearted, ugly. And he says, bring that delegation in front of me and kill them right here. Ugly, cold-hearted man. So the rich men and Herod, that was one area of corruption that the poor people dealt with in the first century. The second was the Roman Empire. Now this was a huge, corrupt beast that would just stop. It would destroy anything in its way. It was cruel. And what the Roman Empire did in this region is they appointed tax collectors. They employed locals to be tax collectors, local Jews, to take and steal money from their fellow Jews. A really messed up thing. And so these tax collectors were rejected by everybody, considered the Benedict Arnolds of their time. They were just messed up. And what these guys would do is they were given a certain amount of money that they had to collect by the government. And then anything over that, they got to keep for themselves. And so you could imagine, just like those servants, it was an incentive for these tax collectors to collect more. And we thought IRS audits were tedious. No, no, no. These guys were way worse. They would go into your home and they would flip everything over, look in every nook and cranny until they found something of value and they took it. And they wouldn't be afraid to leave your home saying, you still owe money or you're going to prison. Ruthless, ruthless, ruthless. So you can imagine poor people under the corruption of shady business dealings, under the corruption of tax collectors and the Romans. And then the third thing that these poor people had to deal with was the temple. And the temple was supposed to be this very special place where the presence of the divine God came and met with his people. It was like this place where heaven and earth meet. And it was supposed to be the center where all the nations are blessed because God chose the Israelite people to be a blessing to all nations. He wanted them to point the world to the one true living God. And that's what the temple was supposed to be. But people turned it corrupt. They messed it up. And during the time of Jesus, the temple was run by priests. 
We also call them Sadducees. And when you think of Sadducees, I want you to think mafia, mob, corrupt type of guys. If there was somebody doing something they didn't really like, yeah, they could just get rid of him. And the head of all of this was Caiaphas, the, the high priest. Think like the godfather. That's this guy. He's cruel. If there's anything in his way, he's getting rid of it. And what they would do at the temple is they would love, they loved to make money. They loved money. They were very greedy. And so what they would do is a poor person would often come with an animal they were hoping was without blemish, and they wanted to sacrifice it to God because they want to be obedient to the commands of the Lord. And so they bring this animal to the temple courts, and then the priest would examine the animal. And these priests would be looking for blemishes so that the animal would get rejected. And once the animal was rejected, they would have to go buy an animal that was being sold in the temple courts. But they couldn't just go buy an animal because if you lived in the Roman Empire, you were carrying around Roman currency, Roman coins. And if you know anything about Roman coins, they had a face on them, much like our American coins do now. But for a Jewish person, they couldn't use that in the temple because it had an image on it. And one of the Ten Commandments is, says, you shall have no images. And so it was disobedient to bring a coin like that into the temple. And so what they would have to go do is go to this person called a money changer. They'd have to go to the money changer and exchange this Roman coin for a coin that was accepted by the high priest. But who named the exchange rate? The high priest. In terms that we would understand, if you gave them a dollar, they would probably give you 50 cents back and the other currency. And then after you did that, then you could go buy an animal. But these animals, who named the price? The high priest. And these animals were oftentimes way, way too expensive for a poor person to be to afford. And so the poor of society would often be turned away and told, you cannot stand with the righteous. God will not accept you. Get out of this place. You have no place here. And so think about that. Those three areas of corruption, Herod and the rich men, the Roman Empire and the tax collectors and temple and the Sadducees, this is what these people were dealing with. It was corrupt. It was harsh. It was brutal and severe, but this poor, unorthodox rabbi from Nazareth comes around, and he starts talking about this thing. He's calling the kingdom of God. He says things like, the kingdom of God is here. It's among us. Repent. The Hebrew word is teshuva, which means return, believe, trust. See what I'm doing. I'm doing a new thing. And then he, he went on with the rest of his life to show us what kingdom living looks like. And he spent most of the time with the poor. He said things like the first are last and the last are first. He says things like, in the kingdom of God, the master did not come to be served, but to serve. He washes the feet of his disciples, this ragtag group of teenage boys who were just a mess. He gets down and washes their feet. He says things like, blessed are the poor, for they will inherit the kingdom of God. He's reaching out, and he's showing them another way. He's showing them the way of love, and instead of fighting their enemies, he says this, love them. Yeah, those Romans, those tax collectors, pray for them. Yeah, those businessmen and those rich men, pray for them, bless them. I want you to do things differently, because everything is different in my kingdom. And so Jesus is traveling the country He's on his way from Galilee, which is north Israel, to Jerusalem, which is southern Israel. They're traveling together. With his, he's traveling with his disciples. And while they're traveling, this rich man comes up to Jesus and he says, Jesus, how can I enter the kingdom of God? I want a part of this. And then Jesus responds and says, well, have you followed the laws of Moses? Have, have you done everything you were supposed to do? He's like, yes, I've done all that since I was a boy. He's like, yes, but there's something that you're missing. I want you to go... Take everything you have, I want you to sell it and give it to the poor, and then I want you to come follow me. It tells us, the text tells us the rich man walked away sad because he knew what this meant. This meant giving up his status. This meant giving up his social standing. But he was also being called out because if he was a rich man, most likely he was involved in shady business dealings and Jesus is saying, hey, yeah, we're not going to be part of that way of doing things anymore, that order of things. No, we're actually going to use the resources and gifts to bless people. And so the rich man walks away sad, and then Jesus says something very difficult. He says, it's easier for the camel to go through an 
for the eye of a needle and for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. But wait, wait. Come on, guys, he's talking to his disciples, wait, because what was impossible with man, I'm gonna show you something, it's possible with God. So just hang on. And they keep going, they're near this place called Jericho, and this tax collector is hearing Jesus speak. But this is not just any tax collector. The Bible tells us he was a chief tax collector, the head honcho of this order. He had had plenty, plenty of shady business dealings. He had taken plenty of things that didn't, belong to him. But something happens in this tax collector's heart because he's drawn by something. He's drawn by Jesus, by the teachings of Jesus, and he wants to be part of that. He's done with this old way of doing things, and he wants to be part of that. And so it says he was a really short guy, so I don't know, maybe he was really insecure about his height, and he felt like he needed to prove something. I don't know. But it says that he climbed up this tree because he just wanted to see Jesus. He wanted to hear about this kingdom of God. And Jesus sees this and he walks up to him and he says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to eat at your house today. So come on down from there. And Zacchaeus is excited. He's like, yes, please come eat at my house today. And it says some of the people around standing there were grumbling and complaining. I can imagine the poor people were probably thinking, Jesus, do you know what he did to us? Come on, Jesus. For real? He took everything I have. And I'm sure the Pharisees were probably standing there thinking, oh, Jesus, you don't know how he has betrayed our people. But then Zacchaeus tells Jesus, Lord, look, if I've, if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'm going to give them back what I took, and I'm going to give it back with interest. I'm going to give back even more than what I took. And then Jesus says, yeah, this guy. Yeah, today salvation has come to him. Deliverance has come to this guy. Because this guy is a son of Abraham. He is part of God's family. I'm telling you, I have come to seek and to save the lost. I can imagine it was probably a pretty quiet moment. because Everybody was listening and thinking about that. But then Jesus knows that they were expecting him to ride into Jerusalem like every other king with his authority, with a sword, and conquer the Romans, and get rid of all the oppression, and establish the kingdom of God in a violent way. And Jesus knew that they were thinking this, so he goes on to tell them a story, to tell them a parable. And he says, a man of noble birth, he went off to this distant country because he wanted to be crowned king. Sounds a little bit like Herod Jr., doesn't it? It's like, but the citizens of this country that he was going to be crowned over, they didn't really want him to be crowned king, so they sent a delegation to stop him. But before this guy left, he brought servants and gave them money and said, go multiply my wealth while I'm gone. I could imagine everybody listening to this story the very first time Jesus said it, were leaning in, thinking, I know that guy. I know that guy. And Jesus, he's caused my family a lot of pain. I know what that servant is about to do with that money. And Jesus continues that this this man was appointed king. He returns back and he calls in his servants. Hey, tell me how much money you made. First one makes tenfold. He says, good job. Now you can have even more stuff. And the second one says, yeah, I've made fivefold. And then he's like, great job. You can have even more. And I could imagine at those, those moments, the original hearers of this parable maybe even had tears running down their face knowing, I know how they got that money. I know what they did to get that. Jesus, you know they stole my land. They stole my legacy. You know that Herod killed my brother. It's all gone because of these guys. I know this story, Jesus. And it's painful But then Jesus says something. He's like, but there was another servant. And this servant comes to the master. He says, yeah, your money, I hid it. And probably with some trembling in his body and his voice, he says, here it is. I'm afraid of you. But he has enough courage to call out this master. He says, but I knew that you were a severe man and you took what was not Yours. You reap what you did not sow, so take your money. I will not have part of any part of this anymore. And 
and the master is infuriated. He's angry. He begins to resort to name calling. You wicked servant. You knew who I was. You knew what I would do to you. And he condemns the servant with his own words. And then what does he say? Bring the delegation who didn't want me to be king and have them killed right in front of me. I can imagine the hearers of this thinking, oh, that's rough. But wait, there was one who stood up with courage and said, I will not be part of that anymore. What? I mean, I commend that bravery and that courage. But that guy, you know, he's kind of stupid because doesn't he know what's going to happen to him? The master is going to probably have him killed. But Jesus just ends the parable like that. It's kind of like a cliffhanger. Maybe there's something more. But I believe that Jesus lived out the rest of this parable with his very life. Because what does he do after this? He goes to Jerusalem. And instead of riding in on a big white horse with a huge military processional, no, no, he rides in with a ragtag group of teenage guys who are just a mess. He rides in on a donkey. And the first thing he does is he goes to the temple and he goes to the money changers and he flips the tables and he said, no, we are not doing things like this because that is not who our God is. And that whole week, that last week of Jesus' life, he confronts the Sadducees saying, why are you doing things like this? He confronts them. He confronts the corruption, reminding his people what God had told them. Back in Deuteronomy, love God with everything and love people. You've forgotten what our God has set us apart to do. And for his words, for his confrontation, he is accused. He is betrayed by one of his own disciples named Judas. He is taken before all three heads of this corruption. He's taken first before Caiaphas. And he's standing there. They're mocking him. They're accusing him, they're blaming him for all kinds of things. They're asking him, are you who you say you are? And he's like, I am the son of man. Which if you know, that was a loaded title. Because he's saying, I have come to be seated at the right hand of God. Authority has been given to me. And then they're like, okay, send him off to Pontius Pilate. They send him off to Pilate, the head of the Roman. He was the Roman representative in that region at the time. He goes to Pilate. Pilate says, are you who you say you are? He's like, yes, I am king. With those words, he's saying, I'm doing things a different way than the way you do them. The old order of things is gone. The new has come. And then Pontius Pilate's like, I don't know what to do with this guy. So he sends him off to who? To Herod Jr. And at that point, Jesus just doesn't say a word because he's not going to take part in the way that Herod does things. And for that, Jesus is falsely accused. He's mocked. He's scorned. He's pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, beaten. And he goes to an execution state and he hangs there, dying, being tortured. And he says the most humble thing that any king in all of history has ever said he says, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And then he says, it is finished. Breathes his last and dies. The king gave his life. And three days later, the breath of God fills his lungs. And he has life again. And he comes to his disciples. He says, hey, the kingdom is here. It's among us. Return, believe, trust, see it is here. Are you going to live under the rule and the reign of heaven or are you gonna continue doing your own thing? I love the story of Jesus. I love this parable. I believe that Jesus has an invitation for us this morning because what Jesus was doing in the parable, what he's doing with his life is he standing up and saying, this old way of doing things, no, I'm not going to participate in it. I'm not going to be part of this old order. No, I'm done with that. I'm not going to live into that. No, I'm doing things differently. There was a follower of Jesus named Paul. 
And he's writing to some of his friends in a place called Ephesus because he's encouraging them. And he encourages them with the same message. And he says this in this letter, Ephesians chapter 4, he says this. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. In the futility of their thinking, they're darkened in their understanding. They don't see things the way God does. And they're separated from the life of God. They're not living in this kingdom because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts, having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity. And guess what? They're full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned. When you heard about Christ and you were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So this morning, I don't have three points or, or five ways that you can change your life right now. No, I just have a question. That question is this, have you put on the new self? Have you put on the new self? Because I believe Jesus is extending an invitation saying, will you stand up empowered by my spirit with courage and say, I will not partake in this old way of doing things any longer. Those ways of doing things that just take and they take and they take and they leave us broken. And they leave those around us I don't know what it is for you. Maybe it's pride. Maybe it's an out of control anger. Maybe it's looking at things late at night when you think nobody else is watching. Maybe Jesus is speaking to your heart this morning saying, hey, it's time to stand up. You're gonna be empowered by my spirit and it's time to say, I will no longer be part of this old way of doing things. Have you put on the new self? Being made new in the attitude of your mind in Christ Jesus. Maybe this week you need to talk through some things in your life group with some people that you trust, maybe confessing some things that are going on in your life because Jesus is speaking to you saying, hey, it's time to not be part of this old way any longer. But it takes and it takes and it takes. But I have a new way. I want to invite the prayer team to come up as we respond in worship. Let's stand together. Jesus, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for the invitation that you extend to each of us. That you are a God of love that you defend the cause of the orphan and the widow, and that you meet us right where we're at. So Jesus, if there is anything in our lives that are part of the old self, would you speak to us right now? Would you shine light like a good father does and lead and guide us into all truth? We wanna follow you, Jesus. Even when it's not easy, even when it means laying down parts of ourself, even when it means surrendering, we wanna follow you because you have something so much better. So Jesus, we invite your presence. Would you shine your light and fill us with your grace and your peace in Jesus' name.
right now, but like the sense that Dan just said at the end, that we're, because of our hardening of our hearts, we don't understand. We still keep walking in our old self. Even though Jesus has paid it all so that we wouldn't have to walk in that anymore. So the strength, the hope is, is not in that I might be uh, thinking better, understanding more in myself. The hope, like Dan said, is in Christ. Just for one moment, close your eyes and reflect. Jesus, is there some place in my heart that is hard right now? Would you speak to that place right now? Unearth it, call it out, and then tell me what you want to put in place of that hard hardness. by faith we call into being the promise you just spoke into each person's heart that exchange you made Lord would we be men and women that are courageous enough to stop and reflect long enough to identify that and let your spirit breathe hope and life and something new in that place. God, give us soft hearts, we pray, to you. Tender hearts, Lord, to you. Uh, Sensitive to the things that your spirit might want to do in us. But we don't want to walk around in the futility of our old selves. Thank you that we are the new creation in Christ. And because of the power of your spirit, you continually make us new. So we receive that by faith this morning, God. And as our hearts are soft to you, you make us aware of what's really important around us. And that we would share that hope within us, that hope in Jesus. And that we would be courageous enough to stand up for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thanks for being with us this morning. Uh, Before you leave, greet the person next to you. Tell them you're thankful that they were here. And uh, pray for our kids this week at camp. Bless you. Bye-bye. That was such a good message to Dan, reminding us that we always want to be a people of obedience. And so let's lean into that truth today. Maybe share it with someone, invite someone to Crossbridge next Sunday. We want to be a people that's listening to the Lord's voice and walking in obedience accordingly. There's a couple things here happening at Crossbridge that we want you guys to know about. And one of those is we are looking for kids zone volunteers. So if that that is you, um, if you want to serve in our children's ministry, you can find more information on the website or at one of our connections desk. And on August 6th in Building A at 6.30 p.m., we're having a meeting about what God is doing in the continent of Africa. So be sure to be there for that and how you can get involved of how God is moving in the nations. Well, Crossbridge, I love you, and we'll see you next week.